Hello there, creators and makers. Thank you so much for joining me on my channel today. I really appreciate you spending your time with me. Leading up to my previous installment, I experienced six mill crashes, and they were of three different types. Now, this was a kind of a rough time for me, as you can imagine. I spent hours tramming and retramming and tramming once again. But I learned a lot in this time, as well as some new tips and tricks for tramming. Some of the things could have been avoided and it was a nut behind the wheel problem. So I would like to share some of my problems as well as some of the solutions I found out to tramming to save you some time and hopefully to apply to your makes and your builds. Now some of these are going to be very Sureline specific situation but others can be applied to other machines as well. Be sure to stay to the end of the video as I'll be sharing another journeyman tip of the day that if I had, I had been told and mourned and I was aware of it and if I had applied it I would have avoided at least one of these mill crashes. Now for all intents and purposes I'm defining a mill crash as a unplanned event in which damage or trouble is caused related to the machine, related to cutters, related to work holding, anything basically that would require me to essentially recheck and retram in the machine. The simplest and most avoidable mill crash that was self-induced by me was feeding in, and I don't know if you could see that, but feeding in a brush to clear away chips into the wrong side of the cutter. Being careful and being aware of how to clear trips is fundamentally important. One of the stories that the journeyman machine shared with me was of a young man that they knew. And the exact details escaped me in that he was either just finished his apprenticeship and was hired onto his first place, or he was a fourth year apprentice and maybe one or two months away from it completing his apprenticeship program. This young man was utilizing a horizontal mill and to clear out the chips he was using a hooked piece of wire and was wearing leather gloves. Inadvertently that wire was pulled into the mill cutter and unfortunately for him that wire also hooked to his gloves and drew his arm in. By the time someone was able to come by and stop the machine the young man unfortunately lost most of his arm. He was seen some months later at the machine shop, so he had survived the unfortunate incident. The destruction and drawing in of this paint the brush that I use to clear chips was a good example of how powerful even these smaller desktop machines can be. From time to time, I will wear disposable gloves, especially if I got a small injury on my hand. Now, I've got a lot of these really terrible gloves because they were all that were available in the height of the pandemic and they were really overpriced at pan during pandemic prices. But these terrible quality gloves are great for an application like around this mill because I know that if should anything happen, these gloves will immediately break apart and tear away from my hand and my skin and I don't have to worry about them drawing me into any kind of cutters. The paintbrush only caused the tram to come out a little bit. And then when I say a little bit, I really just mean one or two thousandths. That amount coming out of tram was really just the headstock being bound and pushed out of position. In terms of the nods, I'm going this way. It is worthwhile just to lock on and just if it's let if this reading run out from either side of less than let's say 2000 it's worthwhile just loosening it and popping it and then retightening it and what i have found is that if it's less than 2000 when there's a crash when that crash happened there may it may have just put a little bit of tension on this headstock and bound with this adjusting screw or pushed it forward and just popping 
the uh, torque on this and then retightening it is enough to bring it back to the original setting. So that makes the tilt a little bit easier to deal. It's certainly a lot easier to deal with in a crash than or the, the nod is a little bit easier to deal with in the crash than the tilt. The next form of mill crash was the most common. Of the six, four of them occurred in this manner. What would happen is all of a sudden, I'd be machining my blocks. And then they'd be nearly completed and done. Then all of a sudden, while the cutter was going across them, the workpiece would just tweak and tilt. Now, the construction of the Sherline vise is, based, is very similar and perhaps based off of the Hermann Schmidt. The jaw that clamps is held in by a screw. So let's say this. And it comes to a nut roughly in this shape. And these nuts engage with these grooves on the bottom of the vise. While machining, I was usually using the fourth position because I found that with the amount of jaw slip, which jaw slip isn't unique to Sherline, it, there is always some amount of jaw slip in any brand of vice, that in the fourth position, I could get the most perpendicular cuts. But consequently, what would happen is that the angle of that screw and the fourth position was more like this, versus in the third position, it would have been more at this angle. In the fourth position, the jaws simply don't exert enough clamping force against a block that is less than 0.700 inches. Consistently, those blocks were that failed were 0.68 or 0.69 in width. In the third position, a significantly greater amount of clamping force is exerted on blocks that are less than 0.700 inches wide. And Despite my best efforts, I cannot rotate the block around. This style of end mill crash taught me about some other issues that I come up during tramping. One of which is a loose end mill holder. Now, in the course of especially long tramming session, the, I found that the end mill holder, despite being initially snug with some Tommy bars, would unscrew and come loose. And as you can see, get some crazy erratic jumps going on here from it being loose. So if you start seeing that weird, you start seeing this kind of weird erraticness, it's time to snug it up. This problem I think would be especially prevalent for someone who actually grabs and handles the end mill holder. I personally do not because I don't believe that's safe practice. The last thing I want to ever do is to get in the habit of accidentally grabbing my cutter. Likewise, I found that I had much poorer control rotating the end mill holder versus up here on the pulley. The other shortcoming and weak point that I found was related to the double jointed armature that I use for my stair indicator. Some of these double joints were worn out and slipping giving me some erratic readings and inconsistencies. To fix it, there's a couple ways. One I chose not to use was one in which I would pinch it together. I found that clamping it together and trying to force it back into position, in the past, that activity has never really worked out for me and I tended to break ears off of whatever object I was doing that to. Since I have lots and lots of shim stock, I just cut a little washer or disc of thin shin stock, starting with a thousand, which I found to be more than enough to tighten it up, and putting that in there. The worst crash, and what I mean by worse, it was the most terrifying to experience and go through, but also knock my tram out the most, both the nod and the tilt. And what made it even worse is that I had been warned. I've been told about taking a deep breath, thinking about what I'm doing, and resetting back to zero. And I didn't do any of those things, and it crashed needlessly. What had happened is that while trying to true up my journal boxes, 
I was trying to figure out the most efficient way to have the number of overlap and the fewest passes. What I had done, basically, is taken my cutter and brought it really, really close, almost touching the block I was going to machine. And I was looking at it to figure out how many passes to most efficiently do my project. Instead of moving my cutter out and away, I had just turned it on. And consequently, the block was forced up and out and the headstock pushed back into the side. Luckily for me, no injury or permanent damage occurred. No cutters were broken and nothing was bent. Before anything could happen, the gibs in my mill gave way. The gibs are made up of three parts. The gib, which is a tapered piece of nylon or plastic, a L-shaped wired gib lock, and a locking screw. The gib lock gave way and allowed enough space and slide before any permanent damage or anything severe could occur. While trying to retram, I was not aware that the gibs had let go. And consequently, I spent hours hours and multiple days trying to get it re only for it to never go back into tram. Finally, one day I'd gotten far enough to be able to remount the tooling plate. And while attaching the tooling plate, I found out that my cross side cable was quite loose. Now, I don't mind that the gibs let go because it might have provided just enough space and relieved just enough tension, nothing was damaged. So whenever adjusting the gibs or resetting them, definitely take very close attention to how much tension and torque Sureline puts on those because it was just the right amount that mine let go and nothing was permanently damaged. Today's journeyman tip has to do with going back to zero. So taking your breath, but also whether it be on the mill or the lathe, moving a cutter from one position to a regular set zero. That might be two rotations to the front or back and to the side to where it clears the work piece. And doing so consistently and all the time to where it's just automatic. Whatever works for my mind and my mindset or your mind and your mindset so that you always have that same zero to fall back and go to so that there are no crashes. There, there, there are no ins instances of collision. After recovering from that last crash, I learned a little bit more about tramming and some of that has to do with the headstock and how to loosen it and set just the right amount of torque in order to adjust the head. And I was able to do so with just being able to rotate it with my hand and turn it instead of going through this long process of tapping in the correct spot or not. Let's go check it out and see what that looks like. I'm going to take my hand and open it up. And instead of live long and prosper, we're going to live long and make chips. And I'm going to take that gap and put it around, wrap my finger. My pinky is too small. I'm going to put my hand, thumb right here. I'm going to take my other hand and wrap it around and brace it with this thumb. Now, hopefully you can hear this and I'll be quiet when it breaks tension or torque. Now. And hopefully you could see here my dial is back on zero. And if my dial shifted any more than a thousandths dial, then simply I'm just gonna retighten, re-swing and see where I'm at, and try it all over again. Now with the tension off, I with the shape of my hand, I can grasp it and I can rotate the headstock one way or the other in order to zero this out. And I like splitting it. So let's say it's proud one side by six thousandths. I'll move it three thousandths and then recheck. So I like doing halves. And if the headstock runs out of travel, then I can switch over to the extension block. Now, also need to be careful about over tightening. Inside the headstock are two parts. And this is also for the riser block. 
They are the headstock pivot pin and headstock lock screw. Both of these are made of metal. And the headstock lock screw is screwing into the aluminum headstock housing or the riser block housing. In my initial trim, I had over tightened the headstock lock screw. And as a result, either on it or on the pivot pin, I had peened in a flat. After adjusting either the riser block or headstock, it kept falling back into this flat and being off on the tram. The headstock pivot pin fits fairly loosely inside either the headstock or the riser block. I would need to expose a fresh surface on the headstock pivot pin or locking screw. To do so, I would just unscrew the headstock locking pin a fair amount and move and adjust and rotate around the headstock, rotating the headstock pivot pin to a fresh surface. If that didn't work, I could always remove the headstock and just physically rotate the headstock pivot pin to that fresh surface. Knowing what I've just shared with you and actually applying it would have saved me hours and definitely gotten me back into machining days, if not weeks sooner. At the very least, a lot of headaches and a lot of anxiety could have been done without. So you never miss another installment of my make of the Kozuhiro Oka Pennsylvania 83 switch steam locomotive engine in 3 quarter inch scale to run on a 3.5 inch gauge track in a 040 configuration or layout. Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell notification. Till next time, have fun out there, stay safe, and keep making chips.